Hi, this is Professor Fernandez, and in this video, we're going to work out an example of the alternating series remainder theorem. This example comes from the notes from lesson eight. You can find those notes on the website and find all these other resources there as well. So in this example, we have an alternating series, right? I'll zoom in a little bit here. Um, there it is. Uh, so we're told that's an alternating series. We don't have to um, go ahead and verify that it's an alternating series. If you did not know that beforehand, if you were not told that beforehand, we did talk about that in video 8.1 in this playlist. So you might want to check that out. That one also talks about the alternating series test to show that an alternating series converges. So to get back into the example, um, consider this alternating series. First of all, verify that it converges. So we'll take this step by step. Um, you could try the alternating series test. That's what we um, did in that video I just mentioned. But you could also do something else, right? So I'm going to scroll over here. And these are a couple of theorems that I picked out from those lesson notes. Here is um, the absolute convergence test. So what does it say? It says, if I look at a series and I look at all its terms, make them positive or non-negative, I take the absolute value, and that series converges, then the original series also converges. So this is really useful. And the idea basically is to, you know, when you prove this, you're effectively using a direct comparison test, right? All the terms are always less than or equal to the absolute value of all the terms. If this one is negative, this one's positive, so this is bigger, for example. So then if you construct a series uh, with, um, you look at the original series of uh, a sub n, and you compare it using the direct comparison test to the series absolute value of a sub n, if this one converges, then that one will converge as well. So that's the basic intuition behind this absolute convergence test. It's really useful for a variety of, variety of reasons. One of them is that we talked in that uh, previous video, 8.1, that sometimes a series like, for example, um, cosine of n is not an alternating series. But you know you might have some information in some cases about the absolute value uh, series, if you will, the series of absolute value terms. And if that converges, then this theorem tells you that the original series converges. Uh, it actually doesn't help us for this particular series, but I wanted to link that in your mind about how this test might help. One way is it might help to deal with series that are not strictly alternating, but uh, still contain some negative terms in negative terms in them. Okay, another way it might help is to deal with actual alternating series. Right? This is the one we're dealing with here. Um, so if I look at this, this is the these are the, all the terms in this series, and if I take the absolute value, then what does that do? <clears throat> it makes everything that's negative in the terms positive. So the absolute value of these terms is just one over n to the fourth. And now if I look at that series, question is, does that converge? If so, then I can use the absolute convergence test to tell me that the original series, this one, converges. And the answer then is to is to is to think about any uh, series that this might remind you of, um, and hopefully this reminds you of a p series, where uh, remember these have the form one over n to the p, where if I compare here, p equals four, and remember the convergence um, metric here is that that p value is bigger than one. We uh, talked about this in the lesson six lesson notes, uh, which again you can go over there to download. Um, so indeed, because this converges, and because it is the absolute value series, I'll just put that in quotes, you know, the series whose terms are the absolute values of these terms, then this series converges by the absolute convergence test. Great. So we have done part A, verify that the series converges. Check by absolute uh, convergence test. Okay, great. So what is next to do here? Um, so let's look at part B. <clears throat> Part B says, find lower and upper bounds for the sum of the series if only the third partial sum is used to approximate the sum. Okay, that's a mouthful. But first of all, what is it wanting us to do? Find lower and upper bounds for the sum of the series. So let's call the sum S. So the answer to this question will be something like S less than or equal to some upper bound U greater than or equal to some lower bound L. So that'll be the answer, right? And if only the third partial sum, remember that in our notation, partial sums are S sub n. So the third partial sum would be S sub three uh, is used to approximate the sum. So now that we've written things out this way, you know, we can hopefully see that this connects to things we've learned in the course. Uh, the sum of an alternating series 
related to its nth partial sum, we have a theorem that tells us information about the relationship between those two. That is the alternating series remainder theorem. So let me talk about that down here. So it says, suppose I have an alternating series, check, that converges, check. We don't know what it converges to yet, but we know it converges, so we know it has a sum, s, and let sn be the nth partial sum of this series. Great. If a sub n plus 1 is less than or equal to a sub n, aha, so we have to verify something, then I get this nice condition. Okay, so first thing uh, to notice is, let me pop out this condition, right? s minus sn less than or equal to a n plus 1, capital N. So notice a couple of things. S is the sum of the series, right? The alternating series. Um, Sn is the nth partial sum. And then a sub n plus 1 is the n plus 1 term in the series, right? When you consider them just looking at the positive terms, like this one down here. So what does this say? This says that the difference between the sum of the series and the sum of the first capital N terms in absolute value is at most the n plus 1 term a sub n plus 1. So that's one really nice way to interpret what this is saying. So that's pretty cool. And we'll unpack that in a bit for our example. But let me now unpack this inequality itself. Remember, for example, that if I have something like absolute value of x is less than or equal to 2, right? That tells me that x is less than or equal to 2, and it's also bigger than or equal to negative 2. So long story short, I take whatever's here, multiply by a negative number, and I put it on the left-hand side of the inequality. I'm going to do the same thing over here to unpack this inequality. So this is going to tell me s minus sn less than or equal to an plus 1. Then I'll multiply this by a negative number, right, and then put it on the left-hand side. So that's my unpacked inequality. <clears throat> and then what I can do is I can add s sub n to uh, the entire inequality. So I would obtain just s here in the middle. And then I have, I'll write it this way. Uh, s sub n plus a sub n plus 1, greater than or equal to s sub n minus a sub n plus 1. Okay, you might be wondering why did he do that? And here is the answer. This is the unpacked version of this inequality. And it tells us that the sum of the series is at most this, and is at least this, right? So that's really useful because that is exactly, for the purposes of this example, what we were looking for, right? I'll go back over here, here it is. The sum of the series, we wanted to find an upper bound, a number that's bigger than or equal to the sum of the series, and a lower bound, a number that's smaller than or equal to the sum of the series. We now have exact formulas for what those numbers are. So I'm just gonna write that down, s sub n plus a sub n plus one, and this is s sub n minus a sub n plus one. So now getting back to the example, right? Um, in this example, s sub 3 was going to be used if only the third partial sum is used. So actually, I can be a bit more specific. This is s sub 3 plus a sub 4, because we're adding one, greater than or equal to s sub 3 minus a sub 4. And now I can go in and say, oh, OK, great. So going back to my actual series, right? If I pick out the an term here, an is 1 over n to the fourth. It's everything that is not alternating. So using this a sub n, I can write out both s sub 3 and a sub 4. So <clears throat> what is s sub 3, for example? It would be the sum of the first three terms, right? Remember, n here starts at 1, and we're uh, uh, using an as 1 over n to the fourth. So this would be 1 over 1 to the fourth plus 1 over 2 to the fourth, plus 1 over 3 to the fourth. That's s sub 3. And then a sub 4 is the next term, plus 1 over uh, uh, 4 to the fourth, right? Uh, again, I'm just writing out 1 over n to the fourth as n goes from 1 to 4. OK, so that's my right-hand side. And my left-hand side is the same a s sub 3 term here. There we go to the fourth uh, minus one over four to the fourth okay and then my inequality is that based on uh, the theorem there's one little thing we have to check we'll do it in a minute um, if that <clears throat> condition is true then the sum is going to be between these two numbers um, so I've, I've worked out that you know to save you the algebra here uh, this ends up being 1231 divided by 1296 uh, plus 1 over 4 to the 4th. 
Uh, and then same number here, 1231 over 1296 minus 1 over 4 to the fourth. Okay, so this is going to be our answer to part B. It's going to be our answer to part B, but it, it isn't yet because remember, as I mentioned earlier, this is an if. This is a hypothesis of this um, theorem. So we have to go in and actually check that, in fact, that is true before we can conclude this very nice result that whatever the sum of this series is, we don't know what it is, it is between this number and that number. Okay, so how do we then verify? The last thing that we have to verify over here, that an plus 1 uh, is less than or equal to an for all n. Okay. Um, <clears throat> we talked about different three different ways to verify this in the previous video. So I'm going to refer you to video 8.1 in this playlist. Um, and the three different ways were basically you verify this as written. So here we go. We would say an plus 1. Actually, I'll, I'll write them out for this example so we can see. So an is 1 over n to the fourth. An plus 1 is 1 over n plus 1. You just replace n by n plus 1. So that's one way to verify it. And then, you know, uh, you can see that it's going to work out pretty nicely here because the denominator is always one more than the numerator, and then you raise it to the fourth. So it's always smaller than the original 1 over n to the fourth. You can reason it out that way. The other way to verify this is in the ratio version, right? And then this would be a n plus 1 is 1 over n plus 1 to the fourth divided by a n, so multiply by n to the fourth. So n to the fourth over n plus 1 to the fourth, which is n over n plus 1 to the fourth. And is this less than or equal to 1? Um, this is another way to investigate it and also to see that it's true. I have a number less than 1, and I'm raising it to the fourth. So that's going to keep it less than 1. That's another way to see it. And then the third way that we talked about in video 8.1 was to subtract these two. So what would it look like here? 1 over n plus 1 to the fourth minus 1 over n to the fourth less than or equal to 0. Um, if you found a common denominator here, it would be a little tricky because it would involve uh, getting a numerator, which looks like n to the fourth minus n plus 1 to the fourth. And to really make sense of that, you would have to multiply this out. That would take a while. So I would not recommend doing uh, this, yeah, this option in this example. I would recommend either reasoning from here like we just did or reasoning from here like we did earlier. Either way you go, you know, we have verified, uh, and you don't have to do all three of these methods, right? Or you don't have to do, you know, two or whatever. As long as you do one of them, then you have verified this condition, and that will trigger this alternating series remainder theorem. <clears throat> so we have verified the condition, so therefore we get our conclusion that whatever the sum is, we don't know what it is, it is definitely between these two numbers. That's really cool. Because again, we don't know what the sum is, but we know what the lower bound and the upper bound, the least it can be, the most it can be. That's pretty nice. Uh, we only use a third partial sum here to approximate the series. If we used uh, a larger number partial sum, the ninth, the tenth, the fourteenth, your intuition should tell you that these upper bounds would make uh, would be um, better, right? So you'd get a better lower bound, better upper bound. You'd get a, a tighter interval for the sum. Okay, we won't pursue that here, but I just wanted to mention that. Uh, so now let's look at the last part of this example. So what is the part C? Determine the number of terms. Aha, so this is a question about n, right? Required to approximate the sum of the series with an error less than 0 0.001. Okay, so here we are going back to the original uh, representation of the alternating series remainder theorem. Um, this is... Uh, let me be a bit more precise. This is the difference between the series and the nth partial sum. The absolute value makes it positive if this difference is negative. right? If the sum is bigger than the nth partial sum, the difference is positive. If the sum is less than the nth partial sum, the difference is negative. The absolute value makes both of those uh, you know, it makes you think about both of those as like irrelevant. If one is over the other, it doesn't matter. This is the difference between the two. So think of this term as like how far off the nth partial sum is from the actual sum. And then the remainder theorem tells you it's at most the next term in the alternating series. Okay, great. So if we want to figure out how many terms are required to approximate the sum of the series with an error less than 0 0.001, 
First notice that this is tens, hundreds, thousands. This is one over 1,000. So if I know that the maximum possible error, you know, over underestimate is at most this, if I say then that I want this less than or equal to one over 1,000, then the maximum possible error will be less than one over 1,000, right? That, that will be fulfilling the spirit here of the question. So we are gonna, and, and how do I get that to work out? You know, this is the part of the inequality that now we're gonna work on. So we know that a sub n plus one is one over capital N plus one to the fourth. Again, remember the a sub n formulas up here. Uh, and then writing out this inequality, less than or equal to one over 1,000. Now I'm gonna solve for n. How do I do that? Well, I'm gonna take the reciprocal. There we go. And then I'm going to take the fourth root, fourth root of 1,000. And then I will subtract 1, n bigger than or equal to fourth root of 1,000 minus 1. Uh, and this ends up being approximately, let me, let me show it here, is approximately 4.6. So for n bigger than or equal to 5, s minus sn is less than or equal to one over 1,000, right? That's the nice conclusion that we want to reach and that we've established. Because again, this is the difference between the sum and the nth partial sum. And we're saying it's at most one over 1,000. How did we get there? Well, we, we know it's at most the next term. And we set the next term less than or equal to one over 1,000. And we solve for that and we got effectively five, right? We got 4.6, but when you add terms in the sum, the n values are integers, one, two, three, four. So the next largest integer is five, right? So that's how we got the five. So that's really nice. Again, we don't know what the actual sum of this series is. In part B, we got a very tight bound for that sum. And in part C, we can answer, you know, even more specific questions. Like if I want the error to be at most that, how many terms do I need to use? Uh, to approximate the sum to within that error. And here the answer is five. So if we wrote out the fifth partial sum, which would go, you know, one over one to the fourth, plus one over two to the fourth, plus all the way up to one over five to the fourth, whatever number that is, miraculously, we can say that it is at most 0 0.001 from the actual sum of the series, even though we don't know what the actual sum is. Um, so again, I'm trying to impart to you how um, amazing this alternating series remainder theorem is. And actually it is a theorem that shows up later on in the course in different places, um, in seemingly unrelated uh, 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 context. So we'll come back to it. Okay, thanks for watching.